morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Bob Stiegel, and I'm here to talk a, about a little bit of code that I've been working on over the last year or so uh, for, for performing fast conversion from UTF-8. Uh, it uses C++. It uses a little DFA that I rolled up, uh, rolled together, and it uses SSE intrinsics for some speed in, in certain cases. Uh, I started working on this problem because I was under the delusion that I wanted to write a JSON parser. And part of writing a compliant JSON parser is that I have to be able to handle UTF-8. And as part of that, I discovered that UTF-8, uh, in order to find code points, you have to convert it to UTF-32. And I didn't really know what either one of those were. So I wrote something that was very simple, and it was somewhat slow. And I looked at the problem and realized, hey, maybe I can make something a little bit faster. Uh, so this is the story of how I did this. I got some pretty good results, and I'm here to share them with you. So I'd like to begin with a few definitions uh, to frame the discussion and frame so that you'll understand the code we're about to see. I'm going to show you probably more code than you usually see in one of these presentations, but I promise you it's all very simple code. I'll talk briefly about what UTF-8 is. Uh, we'll do a context switch and talk a little bit about what a DFA is. Uh, then we'll talk about how one can use a DFA to recognize UTF-8. We'll talk about the code that I wrote. I'll show you some performance measurements. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to say that I am, by no stretch of the imagination, a Unicode expert. So don't ask me any Unicode questions because I won't be able to answer them. Uh, I approach this from the perspective of an algorithm problem. I would like to convert a, a stream of bytes to a 32-bit unsigned integer according to some rules. And how can I do that as quickly as possible? And anything outside that context I was not really super interested in. So some definitions. What's a code unit? A code unit is a single indivisible integer element of an encoded sequence of characters. Uh, a sequence of code units specifies a code point. Uh, you can think of code units as being atoms and a code point as being a molecule. And it's the molecule that we're interested in. It's the molecules that represent characters. By itself, code units really don't have any meaning. They don't identify any particular character. They don't identify any particular code point. The meaning of a particular code unit is derived from the encoding that that code unit is intended to represent. In modern C++, uh, here's a list of types that are commonly used as code units for various encodings and different uh, character representations. As it turns out, you can use uh, unit 8T uh, to represent code units in UTF-8. So an encoding, which I just mentioned, is a method of representing a sequence of characters as a sequence of code units and code unit subsequences. Uh, an encoding can be stateless or stateful. A stateless encoding is one in which uh, the, the, the decoding of the next sequence of code units does not rely or depend on any decoding you did previously. And of course, stateful is the opposite, where decoding or encoding depends on some operation that you've done previously. Encodings can be fixed width or variable width. UTF-32 is a fixed width encoding. UTF-8 is a variable width encoding. An encoding can support bidirectional uh, decoding. You might have sequences that represent right to left or left to right in the same sequence of code units. Uh, and you've, I'm sure you've all heard of these encodings, UTF-8, 16, and 32, uh, 8859, and of course, Windows code page 1252. So a code point, as I mentioned, is the molecule. It's the thing that's interested in, we're interested in. It is an integer value that denotes an abstract character, which is defined by a character set. A code point by itself doesn't represent any particular character. It's just a numerical value. The meaning that we give to a particular code point is derived from a character set definition. In modern C++, 
uh, we use char, wchar-t, char-16-t, and char-32-t to represent code points. Char-32-t being the one that most people use <clears throat> excuse me, for UTF-32. So what's a character set? Character set is a mapping of code point values to abstract characters. It doesn't need to provide a mapping for every possible code point value that, the, that it can be represented by the code point type. For example, all ASCII characters can be represented in less than 128 code points. Uh, common character sets, well, we all know what ASCII, Unicode, and Windows Code page 1252 are. A character, this is the important thing, a character is an element of a written language, the thing that we see, that there are, of which there are glyphs or visual representations. For our purposes and the purposes of this talk, a character is identified, that glyph, the thing that you see, is identified by the combination of a character set and a code point value. So a character set is a mapping of code points where specific code points represent specific code point values or specific characters. All right, so getting into the meat, what is UTF-8? UTF-8 is a variable length encoding scheme for encoding code points. Each code point is encoded by a sequence of one to four eight-byte unsigned integers, uh, UNT or unsigned char. I will refer to these in the rest of the presentation as bytes or octets. But when I say byte or octet, I mean a UN8T. The first byte in one of these sequences indicates the total length of the sequence, and we'll, we'll see how that works. ASCII characters, as you might expect, are encoded in the range 0 to hex 7F. The first byte in a multi-byte sequence always ranges from hex C2 to hex F4, and we'll see why that is in a moment. Trailing bytes, in other words, the bytes that come after the first byte in a multi-byte sequence, always lie on the range hex 80 to hex BF. So, when I was learning about this and trying to understand how things work, uh, it helped me quite a bit to think of the octets in terms of their individual bits. So, Let's look at a one-byte sequence, an ASCII byte. UTF-8 code sequences are, uh, code unit sequences are, the length is determined by the first byte. So in this case, the first byte begins with a leading zero, which indicates that this is a one-byte sequence. The trailing seven bytes, which I've represented by the X's here, represent the information that, that can be uh, stored in this in this code unit. In a two two byte sequence, the leading byte has the upper three bits of one one zero, and so decoders look at those upper three bits. They see that the upper three bits from high to low are one one zero, and the two ones in the upper two bits indicate this is a two byte sequence. There's a zero which acts as a separator, and then the lower five bits of the upper byte contain useful information. And then the trailing byte, the second byte, begins with one zero. This is why trailing bytes always range from hex eight zero to hex BF, because the upper two bits in trailing bytes must begin with one zero. Similarly, with a three, three byte or a three octet sequence, the upper three bits in the leading byte begin with one 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 zero, followed by two trailing bytes. And finally, for a four-byte sequence, the upper nibble, the upper five bits, are 11110, uh, followed by three bits of information and three trailing bytes. Now, if you look at the total amount of information that can be stored in each of these ranges, a one-byte sequence can store seven bits, a two-byte sequence can store 11 bits, a three-byte sequence can store 16 bits of information, and a four-byte sequence can store 21 bits of information. So let's look at some valid sequences. Uh, John Kalb's favorite feature of C++, the right brace. Here's a representation of the right brace. You can, and I've highlighted the bits, the bits of information uh, in, in yellow. Here is a Unicode or a UTF-8 uh, representation of the copyright sign. So 
if you, the, which is represented by hex 00A9. And for some reason in Unicode, instead of OX, they do U+. But what we're looking at is hex A9. So the alternating sequences of yellow, green, and yellow represent uh, nibbles in the byte sequence. So you can look directly and see that uh, you've got, in green, you've got A, and in the yellow on the right, you've got 9. And when encoded in the two-byte sequence, it's C2 and A9. Similarly, for a three-byte sequence, which encodes the, uh, the uh, not equal sign. So it's pretty easy to understand um, when you stretch the bits out like this, you, you have encoding sequences which take, take bits and stretch them out and put them into UTF-8 sequences and decoding. You take those bits and you compress them back into code points. But there is a, an important condition called overlong sequences. So consider the closing brace. This is hex 7D. Uh, when represented as a single byte sequence, uh, it's a valid ASCII leading byte. It's a leading byte in a one byte sequence and it's valid. However, if you tried to encode that in a two byte sequence, you would be using less information than two byte sequence is capable of representing. In other words, you've got some leading zeros there uh, that you don't need to have. If you represented it in a three byte sequence, you would have even more leading zeros uh, where you should be having bits of information. These are called overlong sequences because you're using more bytes to represent uh, the code point than you actually need to, and this is not legal UTF-8. In UTF-8, you're supposed to use the minimum number of uh, octets which are required to represent the code point of interest. And I, I've read that there had, you know, a long time ago, there were some security exploits that, that occurred by feeding overlong sequences into some piece of software X. So in doing this conversion, there are boundary conditions like any problem. There is the maximum code point value, uh, which is hex 10 FFF8, FFFF, which represents 17 planes of 64K code points per plane. There are these strange things called the UTF-8, uh, I'm sorry, the UTF-16 surrogates, which range from hex D800 to hex DFFF. Uh, they are used to encode code points greater than hex FFFF in UTF-16. Not going to talk about them, other than to say that they should never appear in UTF-32 streams or UTF-8 encodings by themselves. And I just mentioned uh, overlong sequences. Uh, overlong sequences, uh, well, there's no such thing as a one byte overlong sequence, but for two byte overlong sequences, any sequence beginning with hex C, hex, hex C0 or hex C1 is overlong. Any three byte sequence that begins with hex E0 followed by a trailing byte whose value is less than hex 9F. And similarly with four byte sequences, any, any sequence that begins with hex FO is followed by a trailing byte whose value is less than hex 8f. If you map out the pattern of bits, you will see that those are overlong sequences. So here's a sample converter. How do you actually do the conversion? This is sort of the canonical, simple way of doing it. Uh, at the top of the function, you can see I have an input array. I'm taking a pointer. Uh, I have a code. I'm using char32 as my code point and output parameter on the right. And then I just have an if-else ladder where I start at the top and I look at the value of the leading byte. I do some masking to find out what range, it is it, what range it's in. And then depending on how many trailing bytes I expect, I do some, some bit manipulations in order to compose the bytes from the input octets into the code point. Uh, and then I have a little function at the end that checks the value to make sure it is a valid code point. This is a very standard way of doing this. There are lots of bits of software that do something very similar. How will you know how much to advance the parameter for the next byte? Uh, you look at the first byte of the UTF sequence and it should tell you how many bytes there are to advance. I'm sorry, it's what? Uh, 
Oh, yeah, yes, the pointer itself's not being advanced. You're, you're right. Yes, I should have passed the pointer in by reference. All right, so I'd like to talk about what a DFA is. A DFA is a deterministic finite automaton. It's a finite state machine. It accepts and rejects strings of input symbols. DFAs recognize what are called regular languages. They're useful for simple pattern matching. They're defined uh, mathematically by five attributes, something, uh, uh, a, a thing that has a finite number of states, a finite set of, of input symbols called the alphabet, a transition function, which determines transitions from state based on the input symbols, a start state, where you begin your matching, and one or more accept states, where you conclude your, your matching. So how does it work? Well, given the current state and a pending input symbol, which is typically called the look-ahead, the transition function specifies the next state. So you begin at the start state, of which by definition there's one. You consume symbols and execute state transitions until recognition halts. Well, when do you halt your recognition? You halt recognition when an accept state is reached, or there is no transition leaving the state, in which case you reject the string because you cannot get to an accept state. DFAs are fairly limited in the languages that they can recognize. They can recognize very, simpler, very simple regular expressions where you have concatenation or clean, positive, conditional closure or alternation. They cannot solve problems that require more than constant space, such as matching properly paired uh, uh, sets of parentheses. For that, you also need to have a stack. This is an example of a very simple DFA. It will match any number of leading spaces, followed by an optional plus or minus sign, followed by a sequence of decimal digits, and here I'm allowing uh, zeros, tr uh, leading zeros in my integer. So you can see that I have a start state. I have transitions out of the start state based on what my input is. If I were going to represent it as a table, the table might look something like this where I have my states in the rows and I have my uh, input in the columns. And for example, if I'm in state zero, which is the begin state, and I get a digit, I can immediately go to state two, which is an accepting state, but I keep trying to accept more digits. And when I finally find something that I can't accept at a digit, I know that I'm done. I recognize something. Uh, I'm in the accept state, so I can keep that. If I have received a sign, a plus or minus sign from state one, I go to state one, which is digit. Uh, I'm sorry, I go to state one. If I get a digit from state one, then I can go to state two. If I'm in state one and I get anything else except a digit, I reject it, and so on and so forth. Very simple example of a DFA. So how can we use this to recognize UTF-8? Well, remember, we have boundary conditions that we have to follow we need to keep in mind as we're trying to build the DFA. And here I've just uh, repeated them. So when I was working on the problem, I tried to figure out how can I find the transitions in the DFA that account for the boundary conditions. And I'm not going to go over all of these slides because they're very detailed. Uh, and I'm, but they're in the presentation in case someone wants to look at them. But what I really did is I started in the left-hand column and I started working down and mapping out uh, the, the binary and hex versions for code points and looking for those places where there were transitions. So for example, if you go from hex 7FFF to hex 800 and you map out UTF-8 hex in the third column there, you can see that there is a certain range of values of leading bytes and trailing bytes that are overlong. Same thing in the, in the first row and the same thing for the surrogates here. So, the red lines represent boundary conditions, which means state transitions have to be created in the DFA. And for longer sequences, I, I, I repeated the surrogates at the top, but you can also have four byte overlong sequences. And then, of course, you can have byte sequences, which just take you out of range on the high end. So there for reference if anybody wants to look at it. But at the end of the day, the DFA that you get looks like this. It has nine states. It has states that account for single byte sequences. So ASCII is just 
sequences, uh, uh, transitions in, in the begin state, which is also the accepting state. If you go from begin and you get C2 to DF, you go all the way over to continuation state one. If you get a valid trailing byte, you come all the way back to begin. That represents a valid two, uh, two octet sequence. Then we have states, partial three byte states A and B near the top there, which then feed into continuation state one and back for three byte sequences. And then we have a set of states here, partial state four A and B and continuation state three and two, which are transitions that are necessary to recognize four byte sequences. So how could we use this in practice? Let's assume that we have a three byte input sequence, which you see there at the top of the slide, E288 and 85. So we start in the begin state, we look at our look ahead, which is E2. We have an outgoing transition on E2, which I've highlighted in yellow here, which leads to continuation state two. So we consume that byte, and we go to continuation state two. Our look ahead is now 88. We have an outgoing transition that matches 88 that takes us to continuation state one. Uh, our look ahead is now 85. We have a, an outgoing transition that matches that and it takes us back to the begin state, our accepting state. So boom, we've just recognized a, a, a three byte or a three octet input sequence of UTF-8 characters. So very straightforward. And what I did not say is that every other outgoing transition from these states uh, implicitly goes to the error state at the lower right hand corner, which is also an accepting state. But there are a lot more of those and therefore they're not on the graph. So how can we write a converter to do this? Well, clearly the idea is to write, to do recognition and decoding with a table-based DFA. And importantly, we want to do the decoding at the same time we're doing the recognition, rather than recognizing and then going back and decoding. We want to pre-compute as much as possible to get the highest possible performance. But we want to keep our tables small because I had imagined that this might be useful in some sort of, sort of embedded application. I'd like to keep the code as simple as possible, but also make it fast. I'd like to hide all of the complexity of the recognition in the DFA tables rather than in the code. And of course, I'd like to be faster than the other guys. So I'm going to show you some code, and there are assumptions associated with the code. First of all, there's no error checking in this. I'm assuming that all your pointer arguments are non-null. This is, an, in a sense, an academic exercise. I'm assuming that the input and output buffers that your pointers point to actually exist. I'm also going to assume that the destination buffer is large enough that it can receive any output with no overflow. I'm not checking for that in this code. I'm also assuming that the destination code points are little endian, which they would be on an Intel architecture where we have SSE. I'm assuming that we're going to use uh, Intel hardware and that at least SSE2 is available on that hardware. Finally, I'm going to assume that the destination code point buffer is aligned on a char32 boundary, which is necessary for the SSE code I'm going to show you to work. And if I'm transcoding to char16, I'm going to assume that the output buffer is similarly aligned on a char16 boundary. So, Here's what the public interface for my decoder looks like. It's a trait style class. Everything in it pretty much is static. Of interest are these three functions, basic convert, fast convert, and SSE convert. Uh, they take uh, char 8T input params and a char 32T uh, pointer as an output param. That's the output buffer. This ordering and style of arguments was chosen to mirror std copy. So in building the state transition table, I'm going to define a couple of enums so that I can make the table very small. The first is a character class enumeration. So by examining uh, the state, uh, the DFA, and the tables that I, I showed you earlier, one can infer that there are 12 distinct character classes, and uh, ranging from illegal octets to ASCII to continuation range bytes, to bytes which represent leading, uh, leading two byte sequence, leading three byte sequence, and leading byte for a four byte sequence. And uh, 
This is a decomposition of all of those transitions into the minimum number of classes that are capable of representing the state transitions in the DFA. I've also got some uh, a scoped typed enumeration which actually represents the states themselves. The DFA has nine classes of input, I'm sorry, 12 classes of input and nine states. And uh, this, uh, these states map directly to the states that you saw on the state transition diagram. Uh, I'm using, uh, you may wonder why they are incremented in units of 12. That's because there are 12 character classes. And I'm using a linear array rather than a two-dimensional array to do the lookup when I do the state transition. And you'll see why in a moment. Uh, I've also got some convenience uh, definitions at the bottom to make the, the state transition table a little easier to read. I have, in terms of data structures, there is a data structure I call first unit info. This is a little structure that represents special information about the first octet in a sequence. The first octet has to be treated specially. There are things that you do with the first octet that you don't do with the trailing octets. So uh, I pre-compute what the value of the code point is by applying the mask that would be in, uh, the bits that would be inserted into the code point as you begin the calculation. I also pre-compute what is the next state given this, uh, given this input symbol or this octet. I also have a set of lookup tables. So there are 256 possible octets, right? So there are 256 possible first units. So there's a table that represents what to do with each of those possible first units. Uh, there's also a table which maps each octet into one of the 12 character classes that I showed you before. And then finally, there is the transition table itself that represents the DFA. So I have a static, uh, I have a static set of lookup tables. I also have some static member functions which advance through the DFA. Uh, I have a special function which converts runs of ASCII characters using uh, SSE and another function for getting the trailing, uh, trailing zeros in a 32-bit word. So just as a quick example of those tables, here's some example from the first unit table. You can see in the left-hand column in blue, these are some input code points. Uh, and, well, I'm sorry. These are the bits, the sequence of bits, which would be masked into a code point, a code point based on their hex values, which are in the right-hand column uh, in, the, uh, in green. So, for example, if the leading octet was hex C3, here at the bottom of the second group, then the sequence of bits, which actually get masked into the code point, are, are 3. And uh, my next state in the state transition would be continuation state 1, because hex C3 is the first byte in a two-byte sequence. So by looking up in the table, I immediately know what my bits are that go into the code point, and I also know what my next state transition are. Yes. And then the next one, as I mentioned, the second table maps my input octets to a set of 12 character classes. Obviously, the first half of the table maps to ASCII. Then the range from hex 80 uh, to hex uh, BF are the continuation range of bytes. And then finally, at the high end, in red, these are bytes which can never appear in a valid UTF-8 sequence. And then in the light blue, medium blue, and dark blue, we have the categorization into, cat into character classes for leading bytes for two-byte sequences, three-byte sequences, and four-byte sequences. So I can take 256 possible octets and, given this table, find out what is the appropriate character class for that octet. When I do, I get a DFA that looks like this. So what I've done is I, in gray, are what you saw previously, the ranges of octets for those edges, and in, in, in black are the character classes. So 12 character classes, nine states. You put it all together, you get a transition table, a DFA, that looks like this. So uh, highlighted in yellow are all of the valid, uh, valid entries in this table. And so in a properly formed UTF-8 sequence, 
Uh, we'll start in the begin state. We'll accept any of the ones you see there on the right, or if it's ASCII, we'll come back into the end state, and we'll work our way through this table. If we ever get uh, input that takes us out of those yellow entries, it becomes an error, which we've marked. Uh, and that's why I had the lowercase, to make it easier to read the table. So how do we do the conversion? Well, here's the basic conversion algorithm for 8 to 32. Uh, I've got uh, a couple of temporary variables or working variables at the top. And what I want to do is while my input source is not equal to my end pointer, just as if you were doing something with iterators, I want to take my input byte and I want to advance through the DFA with this function that I call advance. And uh, advance returns a state, uh, the ending state, and I want if the ending state is not equal to the error state, I'm going to assign the code point to some output, uh, output element and destination. So what does advance look like? Oops, sorry. This is a sort of a map of advance. We'll go through the pieces uh, in more detail. So at the top, we have some working variables. So we will uh, grab the first unit info based on the octet. Uh, this represents the current code unit. This represents the, the code unit's character class. And that's the current uh, DFA state. So, whoops. So, right, so the example. So let's go back to our example. Suppose we're, we have this input sequence E2, 8, 8, and 8, 5. Our code point value is zero. This is our working value. This is what we're going to build up. And we are at this part in the state machine. So I'm going to get the first code unit, and I'm going to look it up and get the first unit info descriptor. I'm then going to find out what's the initial code point value that goes with this input octet, and what is the next state. So, in this case, this is a three-byte uh, three sequence, so I'm going to use the lower four bits of the first octet, you see there in the second line, and I'm going to put them in the bottom of the code point. And I'm going to transition to continuation state two. Now I'm at the top of my loop. Now I'm going to loop over the continuation bytes. So I'm going to get my next code unit and advance my, uh, my input pointer. I'm going to take those bits that I put in the bottom of the code unit. I'm going to advance them to the left by six bits because trailing bytes can only contain six bits of information. I'm going to take the trailing byte. I'm going to mask off the lower six bits. And I'm going to bitwise or them into the code point. I'm going to then figure out what is the character class for this, co this code unit that I just read, and I'm going to figure out what is the state corresponding to my current state and the type of the character class that I just read. So I'm taking the state, which is multiplied by 12, which represents an offset in that array. I'm adding the character class to it, which gives me a specific offset into that long linear table that gets me to my next state. So you can see in the middle column there, I've taken 8, 8, a continuation byte. I've pulled six bits out of it. I've taken my original four bits, shifted it to the left by six, and masked in those six. And that takes me to continuation state one, where I will repeat the process. I get a picture that looks like this. This will be my output code point, because I have reached the accept state for this sequence. I'm done. I will return cur, which is the state that I ended on, which in this case is the begin state, which is also the accept state. And take this code point, the 16-bit, uh, well, this is 16 bits, uh, but it's, you can imagine that I've only shown you the lower 16 bits of the code point, but it's actually a 32-bit integer. There are 16 zeros to the left here. This maps to hex 2205, which is a character representing the empty set. I'm then going to take that code point, assign it to my output buffer, and advance. All right, so how fast is this, right? Is this useful? So here's a benchmark. I'll get into more detail later about what the benchmarks are and what they mean. 
But this is supposed to be sort of a uh, gut check. Is it worth continuing? So I've got some Wikipedia pages, uh, the Wikipedia page that describes the English language in English, the Wikipedia page which describes the Chinese language uh, Mandarin in Mandarin, and the Wikipedia page which describes the Hindi language in Hindi. I've also got several commonly used libraries for doing conversions. I've got ICON, which is a, uh, a library from the GNU distribution, which is very popular on Linux and Unix. It actually runs on everything. Uh, I've got the LLVM converter taken directly out of the LLVM distribution. Uh, I, in AV, this is a converter written by a gentleman named Alexei Vachenko. Uh, I've got STUD code convert in yellow there. Uh, and uh, let's see. The light blue is boost.txt. Uh, green, a BH. This is a DFA-based uh, converter written by a gentleman named Bjorn Herrmann. And I should say that after I had gone to all the effort of working out the DFA, it occurred to me that maybe I could have looked it up on the internet. And I found that someone had actually derived the same DFA about 10 years before I did. So my discovery was 10 years too late. Uh, but you can see, uh, and boost.txt is a very highly optimized converter, that in the case of English, my performance is very close, about 4% worse. But in the case of the Chinese and Hindi, I actually got much, I got substantially better performance uh, than anything else. And uh, this is written, by the way, this is a benchmark running on Linux with GCC 7.2. So can I make it faster? All right. Let's go back and look at our original basic algorithm. If you look at this algorithm, what's the first thing that stands out at you? I look at this and I see, I look at this and then I look at the next step, which is to go into advance. What if the first octet is an ASCII octet, right? Look at all the work I have to do just to figure out that I'm going to go into a state machine in the begin state and come back to the begin state immediately. I've done a lot of extra work just to recognize an ASCII octet. So the obvious optimization is to check the leading octet to see if it's ASCII. If the leading octet is ASCII, I can immediately just assign it into the code unit and be done. Loop back around and see what I need to do next. And if it's not ASCII, only at that point do I drop into advance and try to recognize it through the DFA. Do I get any benefit? Well, yeah, I get some. I get a real nice benefit on English. Actually, I get a very nice benefit on all three of these. And in fact, if you look at it, just this simple converter is about four times faster than ICON. It's about three times faster than ICON with Chinese, uh, maybe four, and three or four times faster with Hindi. And it's faster than everything else, right? Very reasonable approach, very simple. This is all doable with standard C++ now. It could be done with C++ 98. In fact, the code that I've just shown you could be mechanically translated to C and used. There's nothing special about it. As I said, lots of code, but very simple code. All of the complexity is hidden in the tables, which is nice, except if you're the guy that has to figure out the tables. OK. on the order of about uh, anywhere from a third to a half. Uh, there's a lot of ASCII characters in web pages. But I do have some torture tests where I have 100% three byte sequences and 50% three byte sequences. So let me, let me go because I have a lot of slides to go through. OK. Can I go faster? I hope I can go faster. All right. So, Let's look at our ASCII optimized algorithm again. If I look at this, I look for opportunities for optimization. Now I'm looking here at my if statement, which is checking for ASCII, and, and the, the uh, assignment to a 32-bit code point if it is ASCII. What if I could make that faster? What if I could use 16-byte SSE registers and uh, encode runs or sequences of ASCII characters in one shot. Would that get me any speed up? So, as it turns out, you can. Uh, what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to bifurcate the algorithm into two. The top half of the algorithm is going to scan for input everything up to one SSE register's worth of input at the very end of the buffer. I don't want to be, I don't want to be in a buffer where I have eight bytes left, but I try to read 16 past the end of the buffer into an SSE register. That's why for the last 15 or fewer bytes, I don't use this, I drop down to the second half. But for all of the bytes before the last 15, if the first byte I detect is ASCII, I'm gonna drop into this inline function that I call uh, convert ASCII with SSE. Otherwise, if it's not an ASCII character, just like before, I'm gonna drop into the advanced algorithm and work through the DFA. The bottom half of this function is just the basic algorithm that I showed you before. This, this, the bottom half occurs when I have 15 or fewer characters left in the buffer. I can't use SSE, so I just use uh, uh, the ASCII optimized algorithm that we just saw. So the question is, what does convert ASCII with SSE look like? Well, here's an overview, but it's actually quite simple. Uh, kind of looks like assembler. I'm going to work through an example with this and, just like before, go line by line. So let's start with an example. Here I have, at the top, I have 16 code points. Uh, Greek word, and I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's kappa, omicron, sigma, mu, epsilon. And it maps out to these 22 code units. I'm going to read the first 16 code units, which are in the, the darker gray at the bottom, into my SSE register. And if you count from the left, if you're observant and you count from the left, the first 11 are ASCII. The, the 12th one, which is CE, is non-ASCII. So keep that number in your mind, 11. All right. So I'm going to start. I'm going to divine, define some convenience variables. So here are some uh, SSE structs. I think uh, uh, the compiler actually treats them as registers, so I just you know, kind of sideways call them registers in this. I also have a couple of integers, one for a bit mask and one which is the increment for advancement. And we'll see what that means in a moment. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a register that I call zero, or the interleave register. This is going to be 16 bytes of zero. There you go. There's a register called zero. I'm, setting, I'm zeroing it and setting it to 16 zero bytes. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do an unaligned load of 16 bytes into an SSE register. And I'm going to call that register chunk. That's my chunk of data. All right? So here's my pointer to memory, my source buffer. I've called this function, and I've loaded into the register that I call chunk. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call a function called move mask on the chunk register. And what this does is this computes a mask in the lower 16 bits of the mask. Oh, and I should say on these diagrams, Least significant byte and least significant bit are on the left. Most significant byte and most significant bit are on the right. So this, this intrinsic computes a mask looking for octets in the register that have their highest bit set. If the highest bit is set, it is not an ASCII character. So in computing this mask, you can see that the lower 11 bits in the mask are zero, meaning the, low, the first, the lower 11 bytes in the chunk are, non, are, are ASCII. And the upper five bits there are set to one because the upper five bytes in that register are greater than ASCII. Okay? This will be important. Okay, so now I'm going to use SSE intrinsics to do uh, zero extension. All right, so I'm going to do some unpacking and interleaving. So I call a function called unpack low epi8, and what this is going to do is it's going to take the lower eight bits, I'm sorry, the lower eight octets from the chunk register, and it's going to interleave them with the lower eight octets from the zero register. Here's the result in a register that I call half. So now I've taken the bytes and I've zero extended them to be words, 16-bit uh, words, in the half register. 
I'm then going to take those and I'm going to repeat the process calling a function called unpack low epi 16. So here I'm taking then the lower eight bytes from the half register and zero extending them again into a register that I call quarter. So what I've effectively done is taken the lower four bytes in my original chunk and I've zero extended them to 32 bits in uh, using SSE. And I'm going to repeat the same process for the upper uh, for the upper four for the upper eight bytes in the half register. Uh, first I'm going to write them to memory though. I'm going to write my result to memory. Then I'm going to unpack again, unpack and interleave. So I've unpacked and interleaved the upper eight bytes that were in the uh, half register into the quarter register. I'm going to write that again. So I've just shoved 60 more bytes out into memory. And I'm going to repeat this process of interleaving and writing for the original eight bytes in the original register that I called chunk. So I've now taken these 16 bytes I've, I've interleaved and zero extended them, and I've written them out into memory as 64 bytes. Well, now I have to figure out how far do I advance my pointers? How far do I advance my input pointer and my output pointer? So I have a function called get trailing zeros. And what does get trailing zeros do? It's going to use that mask that we computed at the top of the show, right? On Linux, Unix, GCC and Clang, there's a built-in uh, built CTZ, which counts the trailing zeros in a word. Uh, on Windows, there is bit scan forward. What it does is I have my mask, and I compute my increment, my advancement, by counting the trailing zeros in that mask. And remember, trailing means from high to low, and low is on the left, and high is on the right in these diagrams. So I've counted my trailing zeros. I have 11 of them, and I wrote the word 11 because I realized 11 was 1, 1, and that could also be interpreted as 3. Okay, so I know I can safely advance my source pointer by 11, which takes me to CE, which is a non-ASCII byte, and I can also safely advance my destination pointer, my output pointer, to a new location in memory. Now you may say, well, you wrote five words, five D words in the memory that you didn't need to. You're right, I did, but it's also faster than trying to be smart and only write the number of words that you need. So, go back to my algorithm. I've done my advancement uh, and I fall through to the case. I, I've just come to the point where I'm now at a non-ASCII byte. Remember, it was CE. Now I'm going to fall into the DFA and continue from there. Is it fast? I like to think it's fast. I got even better results, so now I'm on the order of, I don't know, five or six times faster than Icon uh, in all of these cases, and I'm faster than everybody else by a good margin for these three test cases, which are basically one byte and three byte cases. I'm hearing myself. <laughs> All right, so now I'd like to show you some benchmarks, not just this. I promised that I would explain it. So I did benchmarking on Ubuntu uh, with uh, running on a VM actually on this laptop right here. I, I ran the benchmarks with GC7.2 and Clang 501. I'll show you the GCC benchmarks. The Clang benchmarks are very similar. There's no surprises there. I'm compiling it for Westmere, which, has some, which is a fairly old architecture, which supports SSE2. Uh, actually, it's very old. It's uh, eight or nine years old by now. I also compiled with, uh, with Visual Studio 15.4.4 on this laptop uh, with uh, what I think are the best combination of flags for optimization. My input data. I have several input files which are taken directly from wikipedia.org. As I mentioned, what these represent is the Wikipedia description of a language in that language. The HTML page. The HTML page. 
I have stress test zero, which is 100,000 ASCII code points, which is not really much of a stress test, but it's in intended to be a baseline. I have stress test one, which is 100,000 Chinese code points, which are all three byte sequences. So that's a 300,000 input code units. And I have stress test two, which is 50,000 Chinese code points interleaved with 50,000 ASCII code points. So it would be Chinese code point, ASCII code point, Chinese code point, ASCII code point. And that, if you do the math, that works out to 200,000 code units. My reference libraries that I mentioned before, ICON, LLVM, Alexei Pachenko's work, stood code convert on those platforms, boost.txt, compile on those platforms, uh, Bjorn Herman's code, and on Windows, since I thought there might be some local people here, uh, comparison against multi-byte to wide char on, on the Windows on the Win, from the Win32 API. Uh, the testing methodology is as you might expect. Read the input file, create an oversized output buffer. Remember, an, an assumption was that the buffer was large enough to receive the output with no overflow. Starting a timer, entering a timing loop, performing conversion of the input buffer multiple times. Now, these test files that I mentioned to you, they're not all the same size. They range, they range anywhere from 60 kilobytes to about 220 kilobytes in size. So, in order to keep things more or less apples to apples, I repeated the test for each one such that a total of one gigabyte of input was processed. So, uh, a one megabyte input file would be processed a thousand times. A 100 kilobyte input file would be processed 10,000 times. But at the end of the day, I read in one billion uh, code units. Exiting the timing loop, of course, stopping the timer, collecting and collating the results. To pass, every library had to agree with the output from my con. In fact, all of the libraries had to agree with each other. That was my criteria for making sure that I was right and the libraries themselves were, were self-consistent. So, results on Linux. You just saw these. This is the slide that I just showed you for English, Chinese, and Hindi. We see very similar performance results for Portuguese, uh, which is a lot of two-byte uh, two sequences, Russian, which has a lot of three-byte sequences in it, and Swedish, which is two-byte sequences. For stress test zero, which is 100% ASCII, we see some very nice performance numbers. I mean, it's uh, almost eight times as fast. Uh, for stress test one, now here's where we see some interesting behavior for stress test one. Remember, stress test one is 100% uh, is Chinese code points. So all three of the, my algorithms do very well, but it's interesting to see that the basic algorithm does the best by about 2%. It does the best because it's only going through the DFA. It's never doing that additional check to see if the first character is ASCII. If the first character is ASCII there in the, in the sort of red bar there, it's about 2% slower, which is interesting because it gives you an idea of what the cost of that branch is in running code. And finally, uh, the DFA-based approach is very similar performance because it's looking to see if the first character is ASCII as well. In this test, uh, the ASCII branches are never, never run because it's 100% uh, three-unit sequences. Stress test two is also kind of interesting in that this, that was the test where we had a Chinese code point, a three, a three octet sequence followed by ASCII and repeated 50,000 times. So in that case, we see a slightly better performance out of the, the, the cube fast, which is the basic, or I'm sorry, the ASCII optimized algorithm uh, because it finds that one ASCII byte that's interleaved between the two Chinese code points. But the interesting thing is to look at the SSE. This torture test kills the SSE algorithm because it sees a single ASCII character. It then does all of that work and writes all that just to come back and realize I only needed to write one byte, right? But still, even in that case, you know, the, the SSE optimized algorithm does pretty decent compared to the others. You can also transcode to UTF-16. I didn't show that code. It's, it's very straightforward. Uh, here are some similar results, uh, same platform, GCC 7.2 uh, on Ubuntu 18.04. Uh, 
Very similar performance characteristics. Here, Alexei Vachenko did not have code in his uh, library to transcode to UTF-16, which are why there are those empty slots. But all the other libraries would work. And this was all run on the same machine, and the numbers are actually a little bit lower, at least for the SSE, because there are less writes to memory. <coughs> the interleaving, in fact, in that SSE algorithms for, for UTF, uh, for, U, for zero extended to 16, there are half as many interleaves that need to be done and half as many writes, which is why the performance is better. Similar performance characteristics as you saw before, uh, UTF-16, and the shape of the graphs, the shape of these bars is about the same for stress test 1 and stress test 2. Although interestingly, uh, the basic algorithm and the SSE algorithm are, are neck and neck there for stress test 2, the interleave ones. I don't have a good explanation for that. Okay, so we have some local people here. I thought looking at Windows performance would be exciting and entertaining. So here's the conversion to UTF-32. Uh, we got very nice results with SSE uh, through the Windows compiler. I mean, uh, from an absolute basis, they were better than using GCC running in a VM. A VM running on a quiescent system where I wouldn't expect there was lots of system overhead going on. Very similar shapes of the graphs. No real surprises. Well, except for boost.txt, and Zach Lane is the author of boost.txt, and he and I are a little puzzled about what's going on here. But the performance characteristics were very similar to what we saw with, uh, with UTF-32. So for UTF-16, I wanted to see there is this Win32 API multi-byte to wide char, and uh, it's used in all the system function calls in the Win32 API, there is some conversion. Whenever an ASCII string is fed as an input, there's an internal conversion that goes on, and everything is done as UTF-16 internally. So Microsoft has this API, multi-byte to wide chart, which is really heavily optimized uh, over the years. And I wanted to see, could I do better than that, at least on these test cases, right? And that was my benchmark for success. So here in the third slot, I've replaced Alexei Vachenko's uh, benchmarks in gray with Win32 multi-byte to wide char. So in the English case, I do a little better. Chinese and Hindi case, do a little bit better. Get similar performance improvements uh, for the Portuguese and Swedish, which are two-byte cases, and also for Russian, which a lot of three-byte sequences in it. And then finally, on the torture tests, uh, well, stress test zero, which is no torture at all, uh, I did better. Uh, for stress test one, which was 100% Chinese, uh, all three of my algorithms were very close. Well, the, uh, the, the basic and the SSE were very close to multi-byte to wide char there with 983. And for stress test two, uh, I beat Microsoft in two out of three. So I'm going to put a mark in the win column for that. So thinking about reusing the library, uh, within the next few weeks, I'll put a permissive license on this and make the code open source. But I just want to remind you that the error handling of this was intentionally limited. The interface is intentionally small because I was doing this as a proof of concept. I actually have, if you look at the code, two different table-based advanced algorithms. I showed you the algorithm for the big table, which requires 876 bytes and 14 cache lines. There's also a small table version, which is a little bit slower, that can fit into 380 bytes or six cache lines. Uh, I imagine this actually being reused either as a library. I really imagine people just taking it and cutting and pasting it into their own code because they will be better able to optimize it than I can by providing a library. Uh, there's only a trivial mechanism for reporting errors. There's no checking, as I said, done for null pointer requirements. And these are the requirements, uh, the caveats that I mentioned before. In terms of future directions, I've been doing a little research, and it seems like AVX2 and AVX512 will allow me to do faster uh, zero extension with fewer intrinsics calls. Uh, so I'm going to experiment with that in the future. I actually don't have access yet to anything that has AVX 512 on it. 
All of the conversions that you saw right now were to little endian, but one can imagine adding intrinsics, uh, using intrinsics to flip them to big endian if that's what the consumer desires on the output end. There should be a validate method which measures uh, length, kind of like STIRLAN, except for UTF-8 sequences. I'd like to provide member function templates that take iterators rather than uh, using pointers, as the interface does now. Uh, input and output iterators could probably be used with some sort of non-error handling uh, and ASCII optimized algorithms. Uh, input and output iterators, since they're not random access, I don't think I could rely on being able to use them with uh, SSE. And uh, yeah, I just made that point. Okay. I think there should be four argument versions so that you could do checking of your destination buffer to make sure that you've got enough room with error checking for out-of-bound writes. I'd like to provide meaningful error reporting, as I just mentioned, the type of error and where it occurred relative to the input, and also provide some commonly used mechanisms for error recovery. And uh, some of the most common ones are to just stop and return an error or throw an exception immediately, to skip, to entirely skip defective ranges of code units until you find a sequence of code units that's valid, or to replace in the output defective ranges of code units with some representative uh, code point that represents an error. If you've ever seen things where you have the little diamond with a question mark in it, uh, that's where somebody has substituted invalid uh, UTF-8 with this character which represents that in the output. So, in summary, sometimes it pays to re-examine the algorithms and data structures that we use from a, from a different perspective. I spent a lot of time fooling around with these algorithms and changing things around and trying to optimize them. And at the end of the day, I realized it's very hard to outsmart the compiler. It's usually pretty smart about stuff. But, in doing the optimization, it's very important to build your benchmarks and test a lot test with multiple compilers because I would do things that would get me better performance with GCC and would make performance worse, say, with Visual Studio or Clang. And do it on multiple operating systems if you can, on multiple hardware platforms. I actually ran these tests that you saw, the results, the graphs that I generated were from this laptop, but I ran it on four or five different Intel chips, and I saw very similar performance across all of them. And finally, last point, savor your victories. It's not very often you do something easy and you catch a big fish, so enjoy it when you can. So uh, I'm going to put the talk up on my blog today, the slides and the code. I'm sorry, up on GitHub, and there's a link to my blog. So thank you. Any questions? Great stuff. Thank um, you. Since you're handling uh, ASCII out of band, not as part of your table, did you consider taking uh, uh, those transitions out of your table? And would it make that uh, part go faster? That's a good question. If I'd taken them out of the table, I would reduce from 14 cache lines to 12 cache lines. Would that have made a difference? I don't really know. Because all of it, as it is now, is 896 bytes in terms of cache lines. Uh, I did not try it. I didn't think about that. It would reduce the table size. My intuition tells me that it would have zero effect on performance. But it's, it's a good experiment to think about trying. I've been messing around a little bit with uh, Lexer Generator Library and, um, or tool. And one of the learnings from that was that if you expose the transition table to a compiler in the form of code instead of, you know, data as a table, mm -hmm. sometimes it can produce faster code because it's the optimizer sees the, the logic, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you'd considered experimenting with that with maybe like one of the boost state machine libraries or something. Not until this very moment. Okay. But that's, that's a good suggestion as well. Thank you. Along those lines, const expr might also help uh, in terms of you know when can it uh, do aggressive optimization. Yes, oh. uh, Jason Turner has chastised me continuously for not making everything uh, in this uh, const expr. 
By the way, co- the Greek word is cosme, and it means we are. Cosme. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, you said you've played around with um, making the SSC version uh, s- do something different when there were a lot of um, bad, uh, uh, non-ASCII chars in it. Can you go into more detail about what you tried and how much worse it made the, fa- the ASCII case? Mm, I, not, I don't remember what I said. Uh, I did try a couple of experiments to avoid going into the SSE to using SSE. One was to look to see if I had two ASCII characters in a row rather than one. And surprisingly, uh, the extra branch for doing that test didn't improve, it it actually degraded performance. Um, The other experiments, uh, I mean, I did experiments with SSE. Since I chose SSE2 as my, my base, my foundation for the intrinsics that I would support, I had very limited uh, there are very limited intrinsics for doing the the, uh, the zero extension. Basically, I had to do the silly zero register and interleave. When you get to AVX and AVX2, there are intrinsics you can use that just do it for you in a single intrinsic, which is why I think uh, that's my next thing that I'll experiment with because I can do the zero extension much more quickly. If you noticed, there was a big difference in performance between the UTF-32 and UTF-16 versions because there were half as many intrinsics calls and half as many writes to memory for 16 as there are for 32. I think in the case with the AVX2 and 512 uh, uh, intrinsics, I might be able to half that again. And with AVX512, you know, you can do even more at once. Uh, Oh, and in terms, uh, I think I know what you're getting at. So what I played with was... Give me just a second and I'll get to that slide. I think I know what you're asking. Um, since you mentioned a- the AVX 5.12, it actually worried me that if you go to 5.12, your stress test might get a lot worse because it's a bigger block size. You'll do more work that's uh, thrown away. Right. Whoops, is that it? OK. Here, at this part at the bottom of the code in the SSE conversion, this is what I played with. Now, you see that there's a branch there Doing this branch, looking for a zero mask, and incrementing by the literals is faster than always getting the trailing zeros from the mask, computing an increment, and then adding that in. So this extra branch, so that I can increment by the literals in the case where I have 16 16 ASCII characters, actually give me a nice 3 or 4% performance boost in this case. Uh, I did play with, uh, for example, the placement of, you know, I first tried to take the the get trailing zeros and was outside of this if statement, which was a cost I didn't have to pay every time. And experimenting with this led me to this discovery that incrementing by literals is very quick. That was one of the things that I played with, and that may have been what you were getting at. Uh, And yeah, placement of things, the order of operations inside the order of those those SSC operations. But so the, the order that I have is you know, it's sort of like simulated annealing. I think I'm close to the global min- or local minimum, but I'm not quite sure. Um, have you tried to do the DFA itself vectorized? So there are people that have experimented with vectorizing DFAs and vectorizing DFAs to do recognition. But I wanted to do, once you do the recognition, you still have to build the code point. And uh, I don't see how, I'm not yet figured out or aware of how one can build the code point in a vectorized fashion at the same time as you're doing the recognition. We usually leave things in UTF-8, so just the recognition would be very helpful. <laughs> yeah, well, the recogni- yeah, doing the recognition as a D- uh, in the DFA is probably possible. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is more of a comment. Uh, it- Related to the material, um, if you haven't read it, like everybody in the room should read uh, Joel Spolsky's 2003 article, The Absolute Minimum Every Software Developer Absolutely Positively Must Know About Unicode and Character Sets. Uh, you really should read that if you haven't. OK. All right, anything else? All right, thank you very much for coming. I hope you got something out of it.